first year uh, I started my company, um, I developed uh, these rashes uh, on, on the side of my body the first few months. And we'd, and we'd already gotten funding, actually. So, I mean, it was like we raised a pretty big round at the time from the time, right? We, we raised like a, a, five, a little over $5 million, you know, for sort of first check round. And so money wasn't necessarily the issue, delivering on that money. And I went to the doctor, and the first doctor said it was hives and sent me home and was feeling really, really bad. And I went to the second doctor, and she, and she said, I think you have shingles, but I've never, but I, but and she said, it looks like shingles, but you cannot have shingles. You're way too young to have shingles. Right, but she said, "Let me just do the test." Right, and sure enough, I got shingles. Right, and so if you, for those of you who don't know, right, shingles is the second incarnation of chickenpox, and you get it when you're much, much older in life. Right, and 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 what the doctor finally told me was, it can also be brought out with stress. Right, and so basically, after you get chickenpox, it recesses and it it comes back out uh, once more. And uh, so it was. Uh, and, but I didn't feel stressed, right? Uh, I, 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 I rarely like sit there and go, oh my God, I'm so stressed. But I guess my body was, was really telling me that, 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 that it was pretty, uh, pretty stressful. Welcome to the MHV Podcast. We speak with leading founders, VCs, and operators on their journey in Southeast Asia. Learn more at www.monkshill.com. Hey, Justin, uh, welcome to the MHV podcast where we get to share uh, our journeys and uh, we're just uh, getting to share your journey to everybody else who somehow doesn't know who you are as a champion of the Southeast Asia ecosystem. Cool. Yeah. Uh, f- good to finally be on. Um, and uh, so so for those of you who don't know me, I'm a, I'm a GP, a general partner here with, with the firm um, uh, based out of Saigon. Uh, my office here that I'm, I'm, I'm currently recording this out of is uh, probably about six kilometers away from where I was born. Um, and so I was born here, here in Saigon um, and, and raised in the States. I've uh, been with the firm uh, a couple years after inception, so, so about uh, about a little over five years now. Uh, and uh, I obviously look after the Vietnam market, plus, you know, we, we do deals all across Southeast Asia, as, as you well know. Uh, my background uh, is actually prior to uh, being on this side of the table. Uh, I was actually a, at uh, spent 18 years helping to build two startups. Right, uh, most recently as founder CEO of a, of a gaming company in in Shanghai. Uh, so I was based in Shanghai for about 13 years actually, um, and um, and started that company in 2008. We ended up selling it in in 14. Had to stick around for a couple of years, and then after that was when I I, I, I had uh, made this career change. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, head of engineering and eventually greater China, greater China CEO for an early SaaS companies. Uh, and this was a dot com company, um, and that, that was out uh, that we pivoted uh, eventually into a SaaS company before the phrase SaaS was even used. So, uh, so uh, that that will give you a hint as to my age and how long how long I've been doing this. Uh, so yeah, so 18 years between those two companies, and then uh, decided to uh, that that uh, the next phase of my life was going to be. Uh, you know, yeah, sort of giving back to the to the ecosystem. Amazing, and tell us more about your roots in uh, Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I, you know, I was born here in, in Saigon, uh, now uh, called Ho Chi Minh City, um, formerly, but actually uh, uh, the, the the center of town is still called uh, Saigon. Um, and uh, I, I grew up. Uh, I was born during um, conflict years, right? And so, uh, but of course, as a child, you don't remember any of that. Right, you remember uh, flying kites on uh, on on my grandmother's um, you know houses here tend to go kind of vertical, right? Uh, not, not what we used in the states. We kind of built up, uh, so flying kites as a kid and very actually, um, believe it or not, a very normal childhood. Uh, we were we were kind of shielded from the world around us as uh, as most kids are. Um, you know, parents will kind of shield you from that. Um, but uh, in in uh, when I was about six. Uh, was uh, when we uh, packed up our bags and immigrated to the U.S. Uh, it took us about a year to get there, uh, and so there's a there's a whole there's a whole um, there's a whole bit of uh, of a refugee story in the middle of that. Um, but uh, yeah, landed in, in Silicon Valley, and and, and um, for most of my life, I was I felt uh, like I was kind of a bit of a native Californian, actually. <laughs> so I had kind of the best of both worlds. I, I was here long enough to to have my roots firmly planted, but. Uh, but sort of in the states early enough, where you know assimilating and 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 feeling a, 
uh, very Californian, uh, very American, very Californian wasn't was it wasn't a problem. Yeah, and what was it like uh, growing up in California as part of the Vietnamese diaspora? Yeah, you know, I I I, I love growing up in California. And in fact, I love growing up in, in, in the South Bay. Right, uh, we had we had all different types of, of personalities of, of cultures, all kind of in, you know. I had a very diverse group of friends. We were in and around tech uh, all the time. I remember uh, when I was in uh, the eighth grade, um, my school had a careers class actually that you could take in the eighth grade, um, and and I remember the, the 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 speaker that they would bring in. What what one uh, uh, gentleman from HP that would do these classes for us taught, taught us we did we did uh, uh, play stock market trading right um, and and my my high school uh, went to just a normal public high school but we had one of the first CAD computer aided drafting labs in the in the state actually so so uh, so we had a lot of donations from 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 uh, from the, the various tech companies around us so we were kind of in and around it all the time. My, 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 my first computers class, I think, was probably in the fifth grade uh, um, there. And so it was great to be all around that and, and having all these great tech companies that were supporting education there. So it's probably no wonder that despite my parents wanting me to be, to be a doctor, I ended up, uh, I ended up uh, uh, becoming a computer engineer, actually. I went to school and, and, and did a, an, uh, the equivalent of um, well, your alma mater, and called EECS, right? EECS uh, at, at, at Poly, we called it computer engineering. Uh, so I, I was, you know, trained as an engineer. That seemed like the natural thing to do, um, uh, given given the roots. Uh, especially since actually, I should probably go back. My parents actually, when we got to the states, worked for Atari. For those of you who remember that, and so they were able to buy um, um, uh, the 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 uh, the Atari units for us when I was really really young, and, and you know, I was kind of hacking away trying to do games and things like that. So yeah, that, oh, that was man, that was great. Loved it. I gotta ask, what were your favorite Atari games? Did you get any freebies? Yeah. You, you know what was funny was uh, the, the, the early computer part, um, the Atari uh, 800, I had a 400 and 800. The 400 had the membrane keyboard, if anyone remembers that. 800 actually had the keys that would travel. And, and um, parents didn't know anything about software. They, they were actually, they were working, uh, don't get me wrong, my parents were, uh, we, I grew up very, very uh, middle class. My parents um, had to get retrained when they got to the States and they, they worked on the assembly line actually uh, at Atari. And um, they just knew, they had the foresight to know that this was something kind of important for their kids, uh, but they weren't users themselves. And so it wasn't like we had a lot of software, and software costs money. And so the only cartridge I had in there was a basic cartridge. And so uh, to make it useful, I was trying to figure out what to do with it, and I wrote some of my first uh, code uh, on that machine. Eventually, uh, we got a word processor and things like that. And, you know, when you think about that time, you know, coding Atari, what was that like feeling? Uh, were you, and you were doing that with family, you mentioned as well. So what was that tinkering like? I loved it. I, 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 I love the fact that you can create something essentially out of nothing, right? And I know, I know people do, do this with, with, with woodwork and metalwork. And, and in fact, my younger brother was quite gifted at those sort of things. I, I wasn't right. Uh, um, I, I, I could like draw straight lines and, 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 and whatnot, but but the computer allowed me to do things that I'd sit there and I'd spend time doing this, and I create something of value that people could sit and play. I remember writing my first game, right? Uh, and then you play it, and you get some entertainment value out of it, right? And I really saw that as a it was all it was my um, you know it, it, it was it was my canvas actually, and and uh, to create. Right, and and the the pleasure you get uh, seeing people use your stuff is actually really really amazing. Right, uh, it's 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 really a rush. Right, and I've kind of been addicted to that ever since. Right, and that, that's probably what's driven me to to go uh, help you know help great companies and great companies of, of my own and whatnot. But it was just a great great medium for expressing that, and really almost no limitations. I mean, at least you you don't know it when you're there. The next generation comes like, oh, how could I have done that? But it's it's an awesome medium. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm one of these. I'm one of these proponents of like, you know, uh, 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 like computer science. At least introductory shouldn't be an elective. It should be, you know, it should be a, a core course like math and 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 science and, and all the other sciences. Yeah, fantastic, amazing. Uh, and there you are, obviously tinkering away. What was your first jobs like? I'm just uh, <laughs> think wondering about that. Uh, 
<laughs> my first jobs. Um, so, 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 I, you know, once again, we came from uh, from working class roots, and so my my my, my older sister and I, who were only a little over a year apart, uh, we went to work pretty early. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, going to school and working at the same time. Um, and so, I, I've held uh, I've held various jobs, actually a number of different jobs. I've done um, I've sold shoes. Uh, I flipped burgers uh, uh, for a number of years. I did tele uh, tele sales. Uh, this is all in high school, by the way. Okay, uh, this is all like 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 uh, dialing for dollars. Um, but I managed to actually get a job as a data entry clerk uh, when I was in high school uh, for a medical clinic um, uh, in in Sunnyvale, and uh, and back then it was on a, an old K Pro. Uh, which was running something like DOS, and um, the accounting software, the accounting system we were using had some some issues. And so one day I, I, you know, kind of yeah, I'm a data entry clerk, right? And I suggested that oh maybe I can fix it if I can look at the source code. And in the end, I, I was you know I, I was helping to, to to work on the system. So it was actually a lot of fun to actually do real. I wouldn't call it computer science back then. It was kind of D-based programming, which is, you know, very specific uh, sort of uh, 4GL, almost um, a fourth generation language um, uh, uh, at the time. But it, it got it got it got me my first sense of what doing this for for business would be like. Right. And, and by that point, I hadn't decided that I was going to do a, a computer engineering major. Um, but I think that probably helped shape. It's like, oh, you can make money doing this too. That's, this is pretty cool, <laughs> right? Before that, it was like, let me create games so I can play, right? Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. And so, and so, I, I, I held a, a variety of those jobs. I actually think, I actually think those jobs in high school were very. Um, uh, uh, it was quite varied, and it taught me actually a lot of skills that I think later on in life that that, that I've used, right? Uh, whether it's selling shoes or like trying to get a donation over the phone. Literally, like we go to work and you get like a, a sheet of uh, something out of the, the white pages, right? For those of you who remember who, what that was, and you just go down and list and like, hi, I'm Justin calling for. I still remember the police athletic league. I almost remember the script, right? And uh, you know, trying to get support uh, five ten dollars at a time, and you know, really interesting, useful nuggets of of, of, of skills that I've picked up uh, during those years. Yeah. Wow. So there you are, you know, taking on lots of different skills, becoming an engineer, and somehow you end up becoming a business leader and founder. So how does that transformation happen slowly over time? You know what's funny? When, when I was growing up, the, when you're an engineer, like I had parents who, who uh, parents, I had friends whose parents were like lifelong engineers of like NASA and those sort of things. And that was the career path because you went in when I was going, when I first started college and you, you'd go in and you would think about going to an aerospace company or something like that and, and uh, a defense company. And you would be kind of a light for there and you would hit sort of technical fellow at some point. Right. Um, but at some point after, uh, at some point, probably, you know, I, I, I was getting out of school right when, right when, you know, I think Java was like at 0.7, 0.87 or something like that, right when the internet boom was starting to happen. And at some point, the valley switched to engineer, to head of engineering, to founder, CEO, and then to VC, actually. So in some ways, I took a very traditional path, right? Because I know a bunch of people like me, uh, it, you know, in the valley that sort of took this path, but it was very different than where I started off uh, thinking my career was going to go. Right. Um, so so that's been a, 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 a surprise. And and it was really um, I think a lot of it comes from that desire to, you know, first to 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 you see a problem and, and you want to see the solution to it. So the, the desire to create, solve and create. Right. And then um, and then at some point you do that enough uh, and, you know, you naturally start getting people coming to you for advice and and seed funding and things like that. And then it, and then you turn it into this. It was all very organic. Now I got to ask, I mean, uh, let's zoom in a little bit. I mean, first of all, what was your parents' grand plan for you? <laughs> my, 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 I, remember, I remember my dad. Uh, I, I, I had, uh, my, my dad wanted me to be a doctor. Uh, no, 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 you know, no, most Vietnamese parents want their kids to be a doctor. So no real secret there, right? And, uh, and, uh, and I think a lawyer would have been okay. And then an engineer was kind of like a third, a, a distant third. My sister went into, she got a business degree and my parents were like shocked. I was like, what do you do with that? And it's like, sorry, she really wanted to do psychology, 
right? And then, uh, and then, so she ended up doing the double because at least business was a little bit better. So that's kind of how we grew up, right? Um, um, with that, and even uh, I tell you, um, uh, even after uh, I had actually had been promoted uh, to be a head of engineering, so I was a VP of engineering at, at, at one of the startups. Which, by the way, at a startup, you know, anybody can kind of be a VP of engineering, but 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 but, but you know, I was doing okay, and, and, and we had sort of survived at, at the dot com crash, and we were doing a little better. My dad was. I remember one conversation, it's like, hey, it's still not too late to go to medical school. And I'm in my mid-20s, right? And I was like, dad, um, I'm not going to go to medical school. Like, I, I remember being like 25 or 26, right, uh, when we're having this conversation. Like, I got this doctor in Sacramento. He's a good friend of mine. You can talk to him about the career. And I was like, because he wasn't sure. What, like, like, here I am, because he would ask me, uh, you know, how's your company doing? And it's like, oh, you know, we needed more money. And, you know, you know like, like he, didn't, he didn't quite get what a startup was. And he always felt like it was a really unstable career, right? And and he wanted something a little bit more stable for me. Um, so that that was their grand plan. And I, 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 uh, it's, I certainly deviated from it. <laughs> yeah. And what's interesting is there you are, obviously, cutting your chops as, uh, you know, a software engineer. And there you start also making a transition into becoming a business leader yeah. as well. So how does that happen? Um, um, but, you, you know, you know the, the, I've had sort of two major step uh, functions, I guess, in, in, in my career when it, when it, when, in terms of moving to management. And they were both, once again, um, not, it wasn't even seizing opportunity. It was actually just trying to be helpful. And then I stepped into it. So I'll tell you, my first one was, uh, was I was at a... Um, uh, a, co- a company called Silicon Gaming, and um, you know we had just gone public, uh, and Nasdaq listing just happened. Uh, the core product team was super super busy. There was a separate product that they wanted to do, which was to link all of the all of these machines together uh, in a sort of a state ma- statewide network, right? And the uh, engineering department said it was too defocusing; they couldn't do it. They had hired in uh, someone who had done something similar at um, uh, ran that business. And um, and so they were going to go outsource this major chunk of it, and so I don't remember exactly why, but I thought that was a really interesting project to go to go do. And so originally, I just went there to actually help, uh, uh, sort of from the you know being loaned out by engineering to go look at these outsourcing companies. And as I, I spent months um, uh, looking at these outsourcing companies, so Justin, so how did you transition from VP of engineering towards becoming the China CEO? i.e. the business leader? A great question, actually. And, and once again, it wasn't, it wasn't deliberate. Um, I think it was one of these where you, you see a, a, a gap at the company uh, that looks interesting, you're curious about it, and, and, and you know, you go and you try to solve something, and, you know, and then I kind of fell, fell into it. Um, I remember uh, the transition made from the from, uh, first time I went into management was I, I was working at a company called Silicon Gaming at the time. I was a... Uh, a software engineer there, and the company had just gone public. Engineering was super, super busy. But back then, we had a hardware component, so we were revving, we were revving uh, software the entire time and sort of trying to build on top of that. But there was a second initiative uh, after we went public to connect uh, all of our systems together, right, uh, into into uh, you know a, a, a wide area network. Um, and there was a, the so the company wanted to do that. Engineering basically said we're too busy to do that. So they had brought in uh, uh, someone to oversee that business unit, and um, the decision was made that we're going to go outsource that, actually. But someone still needed to go help evaluate vendors that, that would uh, provide a connectivity. And so I volunteered uh, from the engineering side, right? Because, you know, the, 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 it was obviously someone we should trust. So I volunteered to go do that uh, myself, and actually my manager had actually gone at the time also uh, uh, there. And so it was just the two of us. And as we were evaluating this, it was months. We did. We this was a big deal for the company. It was going to be a big licensing deal, right? And we were looking at it. And I was like, man, I, I think I can actually build this uh, in in um, you know uh, for for a fraction of the price in less time than they were talking about in terms of there were so many changes that we needed to make to make it work with our system. And and um, Allison Stroh, I still remember, I, I, uh, who was my who was my manager at the time, who, who was overseeing the business unit. Uh, I think she was really gutsy. Took a chance on this kid. I mean, she would just come into the company to run this, right? I, I said that outsourcing probably would have been, uh, you know, going to the other vendor probably would have been safer. But she's like, "Hey, you think you can build this? Go, let's let's go do it." And uh, so, as a separate business unit, we spun off, and I, I hired uh, some engineers. 
uh, and a bunch of IT folks. And we went out, we built this, and we came in um, uh, under budget, um, and we delivered uh, for for the company. And Allison, actually, I just saw her a few years ago uh, when I was back in Vegas. Um, and uh, so that was that was how I moved into into management. Um, was just trying to be helpful as an individual contributor and putting forth ideas about, you know, when you see it, you're like, well, this is how I would do it, right? And you come up with a plan and someone green lights it. Um, I, actually, almost the same thing when I was head of engineering. I, I mentioned earlier, I was head of engineering for, 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 uh, for this, uh, this dot-com company. And I had actually replaced the, 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 the founder, uh, sorry, one of the co-founders who was actually head of technology, uh, head of engineering at the time, right? And once again, it was one of these situations where I thought the direction we were kind of heading in, uh, heading in, we were kind of walking off the cliff. S somehow decided that I was going to speak up at one of the meetings. Um, CEO asked, well, "Well, you know, yeah." First, they asked the, the head of engineering, uh, "You know, what do you think?" And I think it was almost a sense of relief for him. It's like, yeah, he's actually right. Uh, and then CEO asked me, "Well, what would you do?" And I said, "Well, I." I I switch off from this platform to that, and this is what I would do. I think we're building too much, uh, and and they're like, okay, uh, go you pick one engineer, and uh, uh, and go off into your Scoutworks project, come back and prove that, that we can get. Uh, so we got to almost function uh, feature parity actually with something they've been working on for years, a couple of years, and you know, and then afterwards they they folded engineering under me actually. Um, so. Um, yeah, no, 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 no grand plan it was never the intention to go out and say, okay, hey, I see, I see an opportunity and we go in. It was just kind of like, hey, that doesn't make sense, or hey, that's really interesting. Let me go look at that, and then, and then putting in the work uh, when when folks ask, and not to say, well, you know, I, you know, not not being one of these where okay, that's the problem, and not having a solution, having a solution, and then and then um, uh, and then having some some very courageous managers to go back in. Uh, which is which is uh, which has affected sort of my hiring, uh, you know, hiring hire for, for for my entire career. Amazing, um, and there you are, and after all of that, you decide to go become a founder. So yeah, uh, explain yourself yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So 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 we go through so we go through all this, and I I, and I, I worked for a gentleman named John Chang, who who was a dear dear friend to this day. Um, um, he was he was the one that when I said talk about courageous courageous leaders to to, to, to you know give someone who was barely qualified uh, probably not qualified and take a risk on them. Uh, I worked for John for ten years and coincidentally John is how I know Peng uh, and so I've known Peng for a long long time. John used to work with Peng in all of them. I remember we, we when we sold uh, the company we sold it in two thousand um, two thousand seven. I think by then we were a little over. Four to five hundred people somewhere in there. Um, I think I, I, I want to say about a fifty million run rate. We ended up selling the company, and and I actually I was in my thirties, and uh, John told I told John, hey, I'm thinking about moving into venture capital, and I always have a really. But by that time, not always. By that time, I've developed a pretty keen interest in venture capital, right? Because uh, because because uh, I think the software is so bad. John had taken me along to all the pitches. Just to hold the system together while we were while we were doing a while we were doing demos, right? So it was actually John and I who would go out uh, during the Series A uh, up until all the way up until probably our, our B or C round before I stopped going, right? So I thought it was really really interesting. I told John I I, I, I wanted to be uh, I wanted to switch to venture, and he actually said you're too young. Uh, he didn't mean too young in age per se. He said, but he said uh, he said you have a startup in you. You make a great CEO. Um, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, he really encouraged me to, to 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 go start. And I had ideas. He, I always had ideas. We we would constantly talk about ideas because once again, I think there's a there's a there's a there's a uh, as an entrepreneur, there's one of the traits I think is you know you look at the world, everyone sees the problems, and everyone even actually sees potential solutions. It's the engineer who's just or the, the entrepreneur is the one that sits there. He's just really itchy to go solve it, right? So I've seen these things, and so I had a, I had an idea for for a gaming company. And uh, and uh, put John about. He's like, that's a, that's, a, that's a, you should go do it, right? Uh, and he, he's my he was my boss. He was my mentor, so I listened, <laughs> right? And uh, and uh, I, then I, I went out and, and John sat on my board. Uh, he was the our independent board member. Um, sat on my board for eight years afterwards. So I never stopped working for him. Um, and uh, yeah, that 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 was how the transition was made. I it almost didn't happen actually. If I had my way, I probably would have. Would have uh, you know figured out how to be a, a principal somewhere and and and, and figure that out uh, from that age. 
And there you are, you became a founder. So what was that transition like? Because, you know, you had done engineering, you had become, you know, a business unit leader and CEO, and now you had become a founder. So what was that transition like, you know, uh, tough, easy? What was that taste like? Uh, I, I was, uh, the first year uh, I started my company, um, I developed uh, these rashes uh, on, on the side of my body the first few months. And we and we'd already gotten funding actually, so I mean it was like we raised a pretty big round at the time for the time, right? We, we raised like a, a five a little over five million dollar you know for sort of first check round, and so money wasn't necessarily the issue delivering on that money. And I went to the doctor, and the first doctor said it was hives, and he sent me home, and I was feeling really really badly. I went to the second doctor, and she, and she said, "I think you have shingles, but I but I, but and she said it looks like shingles, but you cannot have shingles. You're way too young to have shingles." Right. But she said, let me just do the test. Right. And sure enough, I got shingles. Right. And so you, for those of you who don't know, right, shingles is the second incarnation of chicken pox. And you get it when you're much, much older in life. Right. And 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 what the doctor finally told me was it can also be brought out with stress. Right. And so basically after you get chicken pox, it recesses and it, it comes back out uh, once more. And uh, so it was. Uh, and, but I didn't feel stressed, right? Uh, I, 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 I really like sit there and go, oh my God, I'm so stressed. But I guess my body was, was really telling me that, 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 that it was pretty, uh, pretty stressful. Um, uh, the transition was profound, uh, I would say. Um, I, I never thought I was CEO material. Um, and it was actually, like I said, it was actually more John seeing, um, you know, sort of, sort of, uh, uh, raw talent, more so than it, it, not, not even saying talent, to be honest. Um, but you know, uh, I, I was an engineer. I understood that. I understood you know, could optimize. I understood how to, and I knew nothing about marketing. I knew nothing about lead generation. I knew nothing about sales. Um, and so you're you're woefully unqualified, <laughs> right, uh, as a first time founder. And and um, and the sooner you recognize that, uh, the the better. And just go do it because you're nothing you're going to do will prepare you for that job, right? Uh, completely prepare you for that job. It is that many different skills. The buck stops with you on everything, right? You have to decide. But but I'll tell you, that that, that part um, was okay. The part that, that was a bit surprising was how lonely uh, the job can be, right? Uh, even though I had uh, two co-founders and we were very transparent, there's nothing I hid from them. As there was nothing that John did from 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 me and the other the other executives um, uh, at the company, there is a loneliness that you feel. There is like when you're off fundraising, you can tell folks, "Hey, this is exactly what happened. This is what what I think the chances are," and all this good stuff. But when you're the one sitting there figuring out how to make payroll, right? Uh, this next this next uh, paycheck, and 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 you know, you see the, you have all the optimism, but you also have no, everything that can go wrong. It is super super lonely. And the reason I to say that was because. We were a dot-com company um, uh, when I was when I was working for John, and we had some really really bleak moments. I I, I did layoffs. I flew to Vancouver to, to close down that office. I've done I, I ran engineering, which was half the company, right? So I did a lot of riffs, and even then, I never felt it the way I felt when I was founder CEO. I I understood it. John told us everything, but it was I was always like, well, he'll, he'll figure out something. Was always the the belief. When you're the founder CEO, you're like you're the, the the person who has to figure out something, right? And that was a really lonely, uh, quite a lonely spot actually uh, to be uh, the and the the uncertainty and all that. Because I mean, your co-founders are your co-founders, but you know they're still looking to you uh, for for some reassurance. Everyone, when the times gets tough, looks for someone for reassurance. And who do you look to? Who do you look for? Right during that time, um, that was probably the 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 biggest, I don't know if it's a lesson, right? But that's the, the, the biggest, had the sort of most impact uh, uh, that I didn't expect uh, walking into that action. You know, you keep pushing yeah. on and you're pushing on and pushing on as a yeah. founder. And how did you uh, progress and mature as a founder over time in terms of self-regulating that loneliness and that stress? I'm just wondering how did you personally come to grips with that? I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, having a, a doesn't have to be a huge circle, but having a small circle of other 
of other uh, founders, uh, founder CEOs in particular, or you know whoever's really kind of regardless of title, could be founder president that's running the company. And that's actually one of the reasons why at the firm here we do uh, these founders dinner and founders lunches was was out of that that those folks understand this. And so I was fortunate in that you know I had John who was a board member but also a trusted friend. Uh, that I could, and 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 he, and he had started another company, so he was super busy too. But he was always, he'd always make time. It was always a phone call away. And then, and then as um, a, as the company matured a little bit, I made a few more friends that were that were um, that were founder CEOs. And it was like probably like three or four, I, I want to say like about three of us in Shanghai at the time um, that would regularly get together and sort of trade. You know, it was informal. Uh, but we, we we could we could commiserate actually, and and that itself was was liberating uh, to sort of just give it raw, and then um, and but then you could also get some decent feedback about about uh, you know you, you're like at one point we lost one of our co-founders actually uh, he had uh, lost like he had family issues lost from the firm not 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 <laughs> he's still a good friend today um, but that was tough and so how do you go talk to your board about that and 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 your employees and 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 all of this good stuff when the company wasn't always up and to the right right um, so a good support it doesn't have to be big but a support network I think is 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 very important of people who who are have, who really understand right and that's that's why um, when when uh, I was thinking about what I was going to do next, and, and, and I was going to, you know, and, and doing um, venture capital here. That's why when I went and I met back up with Peng Poi, and this whole idea about entrepreneurs, back in entrepreneurs, resonates so much with me, right? Because there's this empathy that you have, right? As a former founder, uh, it not be huge, whatever, but you know, the stress of making payroll, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and the struggles of that, and, and of losing people, and sort of all this good stuff. Uh, that empathy was really what drew me to what we were doing here, actually, also, right? I really, really resonated what, um, you know, Peng Koi started the firm about, about, about two years before I joined. Uh, but, but when I was talking to them, everything they had said about how, how, uh, how we think about entrepreneurship, how we treat founders, um, you know, uh, really resonated. It was like, that's, that's what I would build, right? And, and so that's what I'm building with them. Let's talk about that, right? Which is, you know, about founders backing founders and that being something that resonated with you. Um, what's it like being on the other side of the table, right? Because, you know, you said your first check was $5 million. You know, you used to be VP of engineering of a venture back startup. So there you have, you know, all this capital coming down at you. And then you're working on that timetable. And now you're on the other side of the table. What do you think you've learned? What's that perspective kind of like looking through the looking glass a little bit? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's it's funny. So when when I talk about the when people hear sort of of, of our DNA and my DNA about former founder, one of the questions I used to get asked a lot is, "Oh, you you must be you must be really hands on your company, and and you must be." Uh, and one of the questions sometimes is when you know when something's going wrong, you must feel so tempted to sort of dive in and and like like uh, you know uh, and and just be there and and, and and fix things with them, right? And, and it's actually kind of the exact opposite of that, which is that I understand as a former founder that the founder is the one living it 24 by 7, okay? And that they will understand their business so much better than, than I will. And the best that I can do is offer my perspective. And, and I'm, I'm quite, uh, and I think in some ways, um, having actually, uh, let, me, let me explain this way, having actually sat in a board meeting uh, with uh, you know various investors, some financial, some former um, you know uh, f- former entrepreneurs, and as a founder taking all this feedback from your board members and sort of almost taking it as gospel, okay, because uh, you're supposed to. I, I I am aware of of the power of what we can our suggestions, right? And so I'm very good at, at calibrating. It's like hey, this is one data point, right, that I'm going to give you, and it's backed by all of this, and I'll give you my opinion, right? But this is your decision to go make, right? Um, so in some ways, that recognition, I think, almost helps because I've had really good advice from well-meaning people, smart, intelligent, well-meaning people with plenty of data to back it up that were completely conflicting, right, you know, for one situation. And, and in the end, you know, the, the, the quicker you as a founder figure out that those are just data points and that's your company to go run, right, 
And the, the quicker to me, the what it allows us to do as, a, as, a, as investors is having that entity and giving your input in a way that allows the founders to perform their best, making sure they thought about this, 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 but not, um, but you're not there 24 seven. You don't understand uh, the, their business the way that they do, right? Um, so that's that's the perspective that I think being a former founder gives me uh, when the, the the tables have turned. So it's actually kind of the op- a little bit of the opposite of what people think in terms of like diving in. It's like oh, I I know that I don't know enough to just dive right in, right? Um, um, but yeah, I mean, but but you know, the the, the 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 lighter side of that is I do really do miss the build, right? And so there, yeah, I said it's great seeing your products get 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 get, get built, get used. You know, we sort of you know live vicariously through our founders in that respect, but it's not the same as like I made the decision to 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 do this white left right or something like that, right? I invented that, right? We don't we don't have that 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 fun, right? <laughs> that satisfaction, right? Um, uh, so we we get that vicariously, yeah. So you know living vicariously, missing the build, and, you know, the founder knowing best about what's really happening uh, on the ground. Um, when you think about working and collaborating with uh, the founder, what would you say are signs of a good investor-founder match? Because you've been on both sides of it, right? As a founder yeah. working with good investors and less good investors, and as an investor working with good founders, um, how does that work out from your perspective? Yeah, I, 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 I often say, um, uh, the other question I get is that, is that, uh, is that uh, you know, with, with all, with sort of, you know, the firm with all of your operating experience, uh, you know, paying uh, um, whatnot, um, you know, founders must really kind of rely on you guys uh, all the time, right, uh, for for advice. And I actually, uh, my joke is that uh, I actually probably wouldn't fund a founder that needed me, <laughs> right? Uh, need, like like in, in the strictest sense of the word need, right? Uh, whether or not I'm useful or not is sort of a different story, right? And so I think the best relationships, and this is how you know if you're a good uh, investor to a founder, is that they, the founder solicits your input, right? Not because they have to, not because it's a quarterly board meeting and, and because, you know, grants above a certain size uh, um, um, uh, or it's, it's restricted by some, you know, some, some, some covenant or something like that, right? But they're there and they solicit your input, right? And, and so, you know, one of the things that, that I offer uh, our founders um, is that uh, one-on-ones, Right, and they're not mandatory. This is in addition to uh, you know the board meetings, which are kind of mandatory. We have fiduciary responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. But we can do a one-on-one, and we can cover you know stuff that's not board uh, related. We can and 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 see how many founders actually take me up on that, right? And and no problems if if, if they don't, right? Yeah. But 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 I, I find that that uh, that more more often than not, I'll you know I'll do the first one. I say if this is useful. We'll schedule it again. More often than not, they're scheduling it and and. And, and I've actually had times where at first it was kind of like, uh, um, well, no, it was always quite, quite good. And then, but then they'll have one, uh, we'll have a board meeting on a Friday and there'll be one on one because they're regularly scheduled. Sometimes they'll align in the same week. And I'll get a message, hey, can we still keep our one on one? I know we're meeting on Friday, but can we still keep our one on one this week? And I think that's a sign of a really, really healthy uh, uh, um, uh, collaboration there, right? It's when they want your input. Uh, and you're doing it in a way that's not uh, not a judgmental way. You're, you're you're there. You're on their side with them, right? Uh, and and of course they respect that you're an investor, that you're a board member, and you know it's it's not necessarily the same as management. Um, but when they when they solicit that input, I think is one of the key uh, one of the key indicators of, of it working well, um, actually. Um, so so quite quite proud that that we've been able to sort of build that here, right? Amazing. And, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of like starting to tie things off here, Justin, you know, obviously one interesting thing is that you also uh, at a start mentioned about how you were born, you know, not far off from where you are currently. And you also made a decision to also come back to Southeast Asia and come back to Vietnam as well. So I'm just kind of wondering about what that was like for you emotionally and as a personal decision. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, 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 um, 
I, I was thinking to myself at some point in my career, I was thinking to myself that, um, you know, I, I was lucky. Uh, we ended up, you know, uh, when we left Vietnam, you know, some of my family members ended up in Australia. Uh, we ended up in the States. I ended up in Silicon Valley. Um, I, can't, I can't say I'm particularly gifted at anything. Right. Um, I, I did okay in school, um, probably because of my mom. Um, <laughs> the badger, you know. Uh, you know, I did reasonably well in school and all that stuff, but, but by, by luck, uh, more so than, than, than anything else, I ended up right time, right place with some, you know, very supportive public school system, et cetera, et cetera. And I did okay, right? Uh, I, I managed to create, uh, I managed to create some jobs, I managed to create some value. In some cases, my last company managed to create some entertainment. Right and and and, and uh, you know things worked out. I was thinking, um, what about the the folks you know sort of in Vietnam or in the region here who don't have access but actually are are, are that much better? What could they do if they sort of had if they were one level removed from someone who had done it before if they had access to funding? Right, and I thought they could do so much more than I ever will. But where we even set goals for it, right? And so I thought, but we're missing that bit because we, you know, it's not, it's, it's just a function of the age of the ecosystem in, in Southeast Asia and Vietnam in particular, right? We, we have great business heroes everywhere in banking and, 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 and logistics, and not, but we don't have business heroes here in tech necessarily yet. Not certainly, you know, not, not certainly not when we started, uh, you know, six, seven years ago, right? And and so I wanted to I wanted to go back and, and support what what I can because I said wow if I could do kind of this and you know grow a company there's a few hundred people whatever what could what what would people who were smarter more qualified what would they be able to do <laughs> right uh, if they had that and and so to sum that up it was really it was really that I thought um, it was it was sort of a coming of age for the region and I and I really wanted to put uh, I I really wanted to put Southeast Asia companies on the global map, right? I was in the Valley, I saw it happen there. I was in China 2003 to 2016. Uh, uh, and, you know, I saw it there, right? And I kind of thought, well, I, 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 I'm from the region. I know the, 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 the raw talent exists, right? Uh, I know it's missing a couple of pieces and there was one piece that I could fill. I, 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 I could at least in some limited way affect you know, a, a, a small pool of founders, right? And out of those, maybe, you know, maybe maybe, maybe a, a few will pop up to be really, really, really amazing. And I wanted to play my hand in, um, lend my hand in that effort. Um, and that's what really brought me back. Wow. Amazing, Justin. Uh, wrapping things up, I'll thank you so much for sharing here. I'd love to paraphrase the three big themes that I got from this uh, discussion here. Uh, the first of all is this, thank you so much for sharing about uh, your roots uh, growing up in Vietnam and the fact that you're now currently recording this and sharing your journey not far from where you grew up. Uh, and I especially love how you just brought it all back together by sharing uh, the fact that you also grew up in California and how you built up your career, not just in uh, technology and Atari as part of the diaspora and how your uh, you know, Vietnamese parents wanted you to be a doctor <laughs> or a lawyer, but you disappointed them by being an engineer, but not as much right. as your uh, siblings uh, uh, <laughs> to uh, be an engineer. Uh, yeah. And then how you ended up being uh, in China and eventually uh, back in Vietnam to help pay it forward to build up the ecosystem. Um, uh, is amazing. The second, of course, is thank you so much for sharing about uh, what you learned from step by step uh, as a software engineer to VP engineering. Uh, and thank you for not becoming a doctor again. Uh, <laughs> and eventually somehow deciding to be a founder uh, and pushing on despite the uh, stress induced shingles uh, to push on and uh, keep going and uh, take everything that you learn to eventually become uh, a VC, uh, you know, bringing capital, your personal experience and your learnings uh, back to Southeast Asia. And lastly, thank you so much for sharing um, all that you've learned uh, from both sides of the table about what it means uh, to have uh, at a high level um a healthy relationship at the board level, right, between the VC and the founder, but also what it means at the one-on-one -on -one level and on a personal level, on a relationship uh, and, um, you know, strategic uh, and day-to-day uh, -day level. So uh, thank you so much, Justin, for sharing uh, your entire journey and uh, look forward to hearing more in the days ahead. Yeah, this was fun. I look forward to the next one. Thank you for listening. 
If you enjoyed the MHV podcast, please share this episode with your friends and colleagues. Go to www.monkshill.com for more founders' journeys, company building advice, and insights into regional tech trends.